Okay, we're recording. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is a community meeting for special use permit application SB 2021 00014, Reclaimed Hope Initiative. This meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with emergency ordinance number 20-A16, an emergency ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during COVID-19 and open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. My name is Mariah Gleason. I'm a senior planner too and lead reviewer for the county in the, on this proposal. We also have the applicant team who will introduce themselves as we go. And finally, listening in tonight are Supervisor Liz Palmer and Commissioner Karen Firehawk. Following the presentations, we invite you to share your comments or questions during the Q&A portion of tonight's meeting. You can participate online by, by clicking the raise hand button at the bottom of your toolbar. This will notify the meeting facilitator that you would like to speak and you will be placed in the queue. If you're joining by phone, please press star nine to raise your hand and be placed in the queue to speak. And I'll repeat these instructions again when we get to the Q&A portion of the agenda. Um, so before turning this over to the applicant team, I'm going to give a short presentation about the purpose of this meeting, the development review process, and some basic project information. So um, bear with me as I share my screen. Okay. Let me know if you don't see anything. You should be seeing trees right now. Okay, great. Um, thank you for the head notes. Um, minimize this. Okay, um, so again, my name is Mariah Gleason, a senior planner too in the planning division of Albemarle County. Um, if you've attended a community meeting in the past year, this presentation may look familiar to you. We use a standard template um, when talking about special use permits and similar projects at community meetings. So the purpose of community meetings relative to special use permits is that they provide a space to share information about the proposed project, the development review process, and relevant policies and regulations that might apply to the specific application. Community meetings are also a way for the applicant and the county to solicit public input on proposed projects. A summary of this input is included in the staff report that's reviewed by the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. So in terms of how development works and um, the review process in the county, we have this graphic. And this image might be a bit fuzzy, but um, what it shows in colored blocks are stages of the county development process. I can talk more about the overall process, but the important takeaway here is that the, this project is at the beginning of the process. So the county zoning ordinance dictates what can be done by right on a property today. The county, um, county staff review proposed developments to make sure that they meet regulations contained in the zoning ordinance and protect public healthy, help, I'm sorry, public health, safety, and welfare. Legally, staff can't deny a by right use. Um, the review process for a by right use is called an administrative review. The process we're currently in is called a legislative review, which means that the project has to be approved by the Board of Supervisors. This is because the applicant is requesting a use on the property that is not a by right use, but is what is instead called a special use. So special use applications have a higher level of review. That includes review by the typical reviewing agencies and authorities, and authorities such as VDOT, um, Ravana Water and Sewer Authority, uh, the county engineer, fire rescue, E911. Um, it also includes review by the planning commission and board of supervisors. Um, the, the planning commission and board of supervisors consider special use applications at meetings that are referred to as public hearings. Public hearings include presentations by staff, the applicant, and a public comment period. So you are welcome to attend and comment on this project at those meetings as additional opportunities beyond this meeting tonight. Um, though I should say that no date has been set for either of those meetings yet. So when reviewing or considering a special use permit, the aspects or factors to be considered include four things um, that are listed here. The evaluation of whether the proposed use will create substantial detriment to adjacent parcels, whether the character of the nearby area is unchanged, 
um, whether the proposed special use is in harmony with the purpose and intent of the rural area in this case, and the consistency with the comprehensive plan. So before turning this over to the applicant, I'll, I'm just gonna share some introductory information about the proposal itself. The proposal is a request for day camp boarding camp uses on tax map parcels TMP 8823, which is this parcel seen here in about this area, and 8823E, which is this kind of L-shaped here. Um, the, proper, the subject properties are a total of 54 acres. Um, the, the proposal includes renovating existing residential structures to serve the use and approximately 14,000 square feet in additional development. Uh, new buildings include visitor cabins, communal structures, and the groundskeeper house that are proposed in the existing cleared areas on the subject property. There are no special exceptions to the county code that are being requested with this proposal. Um, the subject property does fall within, an, within the Hardware Agricultural Forestal District. So this application will have an added technical review by the Agricultural Forestal District Advisory Committee. So in terms of the timeline of this particular application, comments were sent to the applicant, which are just staff review comments on August 11th, 2021. The applicant is planning to submit revised materials. So they, the application is currently in a period of deferral, which does not defer the deferral only defers when the application goes to a public hearing. It doesn't defer the um, review of a proposal, it just defers when it goes to the uh, public hearing. So no public hearing with the Planning Commission or Board, or, or board of Supervisors has been set at this point. Um, and then just um, as we go through tonight, just please know that staff will be putting together a summary of the discussion from this meeting. If there are additional comments you wish to be included in the summary, um, please send your comments to me by Tuesday, September 14th, which is one week from tonight. That was the same date that was in the mailing notice that you received. And my email is provided below. Um, I'll also pull up this slide at the end after the um, discussion period, just so you, if you don't get a chance to copy it down now, it will be up later. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the applicants, Paul and Bettina Stevens um, for their presentation. Thank you, Mariah. And thank you everybody who's on the call tonight. We appreciate your time. Um, my name is Bettina Stevens, and this is my husband, Paul Stevens. We are the co-founders of Reclaimed Hope Initiative, which is a local nonprofit here in Charlottesville that serves foster, adoptive, and special needs families. Our goal is to bring wraparound services to both parents and children as they navigate um, physical, behavioral, emotional, and intellectual health needs with the goal of limiting um, residential facility use, group homes, inpatient hospital stays, or family disruption. Um, we know this firsthand as we have three uh, adopted children ourselves and we are also foster parents. And we have seen um, the toll it takes on parents to be full-time caregivers. And as a result, we founded Reclaimed Hope Initiative in 2018 as a result to meet that need in our community and bridge the gap. Since that time, we've grown about 900% and we now serve 65 families from Scottsville to Stanton, including support services, meal deliveries. Um, we have a, a camp that we host in the summer. We also um, do respite care, training for caregivers and family support services. Um, additionally, tonight we have one of our board members with us, Marnie Allen, who will be joining us for the Q&A portion to share what she's seen as a board member and how we can bridge the gap, as well as what something like this would mean to us as a community, especially for the parents and families that we serve. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Paul and I'm going to let him share a little bit more about the site development and the plan that we have in place for the farm. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to share my screen here. One second. All right, 
So the farm is the idea to create a respite retreat for families here in Charlottesville and Albemarle County um, with the idea of having um, upper and lower parcels that would serve parents and children separately. So many times because of the needs that these children present with, whether it's physical, behavioral, emotional, or intellectual, it often gives parents very little time to be able to enjoy time away or for a family to enjoy a vacation or a trip because their needs are so severe. So the idea that we are um, presenting to create the farm is a retreat center for an entire family. So the idea that um, parents and children would come to one locality, the parents would have a completely separate respite portion and the children would have more of um, a therapeutic setting to be able to meet their needs. So it would be more of like a reservation. So parent families could come and stay for one night or a weekend with the goal of creating respite for the parents and also creating space for the kids in a therapeutic environment where um, their emotional, physical and mental health needs can be met. So and a little more of the details uh, for those of you who have not been able to see the plan. Um, Mariah did a, gave a great summary, um, as better than I could do in a minute, Mariah, of the project and what we're planning to do, so appreciate that. But these are the two parcels again. You can see there's the body of water kind of between the two of them. Um, our intent coming in here um, is certainly not to do any type of clear cutting or um, you know, ruin the, the beauty uh, that Almaro County provides. Our, our goal is to, to utilize that beauty and provide an opportunity uh, for for kids to come out and enjoy a camp type setting um, and for the parents to come out and enjoy what I would call parents preferred camp type setting. Um, and so as Bettina alluded to, um, the, the lower parcel, the existing uh, structure originally built uh, around 1850 will remain. Uh, we will do some renovations and some adding some uh, different um, structures around, which you'll see in the next plan. Uh, and then you're driving up uh, the driveway up to the upper parcel is an existing house that again would remain um, and we would do some renovations to and then add a few different structures up here. Um, this plan does not accurately represent necessarily what we are planning to do as far as the existing development and clearing. We are intending to keep the tree lines uh, as they are to, to maintain those buffers uh, to, to neighbors to, to keep the kind of the nature portion of it um, as it is. So this is a, an overview. I won't spend too long because we're going to get a zoomed in uh, view of this, of, of both of these, and we can talk uh, in detail about them. But this is kind of the whole layout of um, what we are intending to do. Uh, this is a multi-year uh, plan for us as far as um, adding these various structures uh, to the what we call the lower parcel or Camp Carroll, and then the upper parcel, we, what we call the farm. Um, so on the, uh, on the upper parcel, you can see we've, we've tried to give a good conceptual layout while still helping um, those who are interested understand the tree line and what we are intending to do. So uh, this uh, A here, the structure is the existing house. So anything that we are going to add, um, we're adding some walking trails and some other outdoor gardens and different spaces. Uh, there are kind of three other actual structures uh, that would be added and that's uh, kind of the groundskeeper house, um, S over here, uh, R, what we're calling the uh, kind of small event space, and then B is kind of our the self care centers. So this would kind of be the the hub for parents to kind of come and stay. This would kind of where they would get to do their kind of camp activities, and uh, that being um, counseling or some type of exercise or uh, yoga or just spending time outside, whatever it is they feel like they need to to kind of recharge. Uh, so that's the biggest of the structures, and then. Um, the, the small event center, our, our intent there is, again, not to host any kind of regular um, daily large events, but um, when you read through the, our proposal, um, there's a, a few times a year is when we're talking about bringing uh, larger groups of people um, that are either associated directly with RHI or in affiliation with, um, sorry, Reclaimed Hope Initiative uh, to the property. Uh, and then I will switch the lower parcel. Uh, so this again is uh, meant for the kids who would come to be able to enjoy. And these would be kids that are in the same uh, family unit as the, the adults that are on the upper parcel. Um, they would kind of come and again, uh, staying in the main house uh, and keeping the other existing structure here, uh, adding some, some flat kind of play areas, some paved areas, a pool. These are the, um, the cabins that are being proposed um, for the kids, as well as the playground. 
And then the largest additional structure down here is, um, is the hall. It's kind of the, the main hub, kind of the heart of the, of the kids' space uh, where they would come, uh, they would kind of eat, where they would gather, uh, where you'd be able to kind of hold uh, all the kids. Um, and when I say all the kids, we can, I'm, I'm sure there'll be questions about how many. There's some details in our proposal about how many uh, campers uh, we would intend to have or be allowed to have. Um, the county, we've had some very good back and forth conversation. Um, and Mariah can probably speak to some of that as far as um, conditions on a special use permit. Uh, but this is ultimately where we've landed with our kind of proposal of what we would hope to do um, with the two pieces of property, uh, bringing them together to be uh, kind of under one name with kind of two um, different functions, but that are meant to be used in unison um, by, a, by a family unit. Yeah, and I will say the goal is to really create um, a calming therapeutic environment. So we have had conversations with other community members um, in regards to noise. The goal is really to create a calming space, both lower and upper, um, that will allow families to come. In terms of our proposal, we've said that we would have no more than six household families at any given time. So that would be you know, a total of 12 adults and then whatever children they are bringing with them, but it would not include extended family or family reunions or larger gatherings in that regard. Um, with the goal of keeping it small and intimate so families can really have more space. And the goal is really to have healing through nature so that children can have space to um, access therapeutic interventions. And so can parents, but in a camp-like setting through water, trees, trails, um, and the other things that we're proposing. Um, in terms of our summer camp, because of the demographic we serve, many of these children are high needs. And so the goal is not to create a camp with a lot of campers, but a smaller um, camp where we're able to actually meet the needs of the children on an individual level. So for example, the camp that we hosted this last summer, we hosted at Waldorf School. We had a maximum of 35 children for the entire camp with no more than 20 kids in a given week. Our goal long-term would not be no more than 40 kids that we would serve at the camp long-term with the hope of being able to again meet individual therapeutic needs for each child um, and also creating safe spaces for them to enjoy nature and have an existing day camp similar to their peers. So the, the goal that this is meeting is many of the children we serve are unable to attend an existing day camp in this community because their needs are so high. So our goal is to bridge that gap and allow children to have similar relationships as peers um, similar experiences as peers, but with the uh, individual therapeutic interventions that they need to feel successful. So again, we just want to reiterate the goal is to keep as much of that buffer between neighbors to minimize noise and as and really just to meet these families in a relaxing therapeutic way. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever parented a child with special needs or mental health needs, but um, I will say we all want a quiet house. And so the goal of coming to the farm would be to create more of that quiet space for both families and children. Um, in terms of staffing, we would probably only have the groundskeeper living on the uh, premises year round in order to help with maintenance and keeping things cleared and um, up to date, the goal would be um, to then have a kind of a variable flux of how many families would be coming in again with a maximum of six household families. But the um, in terms of our layout, we anticipate there would be some weeks where we have no families and some weeks where we have just one or two. Um, and then camp would be kind of a solid six weeks in the summer where we would have that higher number of children, a maximum of 40, um, which would be for those six to eight weeks over the course of the summer. So I Mariah, I think that's it from a presentation standpoint, kind of an overview of what we're proposing. Um, that's that's all we have, right? Yeah, and I was just going to say the only revision that we plan to submit is just looking a little bit more at the site plan and what we are proposing to build. Um, so when Mariah was talking about we're in deferral in terms of resubmitting one more application, the goal is to just kind of look at the property one more time and just resubmit an ideal structure and layout for where we would plan to build things in terms of keeping the rural area um, and the views as is. 
Um, well, thank you, Paul and Bettina. Um, as we head into the Q&A portion of the meeting, um, I'm gonna repeat the participation instructions so everyone knows how to participate and ask questions. Um, I realize we're just a bit um, ahead in schedule. So um, or if you were late joining, um, here are the instructions for how to participate. So if you're joining us online, you can share your comments or questions by clicking the raise hand button at the bottom of your toolbar. Uh, this will notify the meeting facilitator that you would like to speak and you will be placed in the queue. Um, similarly, if you're joining by phone, you wanna press star nine, again, that's star nine, to raise your hand and be placed in the queue to speak. Um, and it looks like we already have one person. So um, Vivian, if you wouldn't mind um, un or passing them through. Yes, we have uh, Lindsay Sack. Hello, um, my name is Lindsay and um, I'm a resident of Charlottesville. My husband and I are um, homeowners here and we have adopted four kids from foster care. Um, we are a part of the Reclaim Hope Initiative support group for foster and adoptive families. Um, and we are uh, really excited about the options that Paul and Bettina are presenting. We, uh, our 10 year old son this summer needed to, needed a higher level of care. We were, we were able to get great services in the community and in home and through school um, with the help of Region 10. But when we had maxed out all those services, um, residential was, was um, recommended. And there is not a residential facility for a 10 year old child in Charlottesville. Um, and you have to be placed over an hour outside of the city to be in residential at that age group. Um, and so this would, uh, and, and another, so, so it'd be wonderful to keep kids local that have, um, that have mental health and behavioral needs. The other part is there is no bridge between in-home in -home services and residential. So if you can't, there's no respite option that, that would mediate between those two. So if you can't, if you max out at in-home, you're immediately in residential when I think a lot of, would have been helpful for our family to have an intermediate step where we could take some breaks because when your child has such high needs, there is no one to come and help give you a break. You are the only person that is that does this job, you know, that that can step in. So um, this would provide a wonderful intermediate step for the community so that kids can stay in their homes longer, um, so that parents can get respite and care for themselves for caring for these high need children. And then too, just the setting, like um, Paul and Bettina said, when we are researching um, places for our son, there's so many of them that are kind of like a institution or like a nursing home setting. Um, and that's just not okay for young children to be put into a nursing home setting. <laughs> I mean, it, it looks like a nursing home, obviously it's not, but, um, and so, you know, the ability to be able to meet the needs of the kids in this community with a local, an intermediate step that, that, that just does not exist in this community at all to be able to provide that respite. And then in, an, in a setting that is in nature, that has things that kids wanna do um, is, is just a win for everyone. So I'm, I'm very excited about this option. I hope it gets approval and I'm happy to talk to anyone else that <laughs> I need to, to show my support. So thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. We have Thank you, Vivian. Tim Clayton. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Sina Clayton, and uh, I'm a resident of the city of Charlottesville. My husband and I um, have lived here for about seven years um, and own a home in the city. And we have been connected with um, Paul and Bettina and Reclaimed Hope Initiative since um, about the time that it started. We have three children, the youngest of which is adopted and um, has some special needs. And so for our family, it's been um, just such a gift to find the community that we found at Reclaimed 
Claimed Hope Initiative and to be able to connect with other families that are walking through some of the same things that we are. Um, our daughter was also able to participate in the summer camp this summer, um, which was amazing. Like she loved being able to participate in camp and like come home and be able to share her experiences with her siblings. Um, because like Bettina said, like we would not be able to send her to some of the camp options that we send our other two kids to because she just would not be able to function in those settings. And so to have um, this option that we could send her to where we knew that um, her needs would be met and she would be seen um, and be able to just grow and um, enjoy a camp, a, a summer camp, um, in a way that she otherwise wouldn't have been able to um, was absolutely amazing. Um, I can say that if this place, the farm existed right now, like our family would already be signed up um, <laughs> because we definitely need it. Um, you know, if, if you don't have either, if you don't have family nearby that can help with sort of some of that respite childcare, or, you know, some of us have kids that um, where that's not an ask that you can just give to the grandparents or friends or aunts and uncles. Um, so to be able to have something like that would be, um, I mean, it would be a total game changer for our family. There's no doubt about it. So um, yeah, just echoing what Lindsay said, like I really hope that this is gonna be approved. Like I think it's gonna meet such a huge need in our community. I know when I speak with the various professionals that my daughter sees, um, and tell them about this, like they're really excited and echo the fact that like this is a need that exists in our community for families. And um, so I'm just really excited that Paul and Bettina are stepping into this and um, excited to see this project move forward. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sydney. It sounds like we have um, several people in the queue. So what we're gonna start doing, um, just to make sure that everybody gets a turn to speak, we're gonna start timing people three minutes. Um, that's the same amount of time that, that is provided at um, our other public hearing meetings. So um, we're going to ask that you keep your comments to three minutes. And if it sound, if if you have more to say, feel free to send me an email and I will include it in the summary um, or forward it to the applicants if that's more appropriate. But um, Vivian, um, feel free to usher them. Um, okay. We have Nora Silheimer. If you can unmute. Okay, hi, sorry. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Nora Seilheimer and I live um, on an adjoining property. And I am calling in today to express my concern for the special use permit relating to the Reclaimed Hope Initiative. It, seemed to me, it seems to me that the Reclaimed Hope Initiative is a fine organization that helps many people and is doing good work in the community, as we've already heard. However, um, I'm here to discuss not the worthiness of the organization, but rather the land use issues associated with the special use permit and the character of Albemarle County and the sur surrounding properties, including my own. As we all know, our county has adopted a comprehensive plan to, in quotations, establish Albemarle County's long range vision that guides growth, development and change. The intent of the comprehensive plan is to focus, again, in quotations taken from the comprehensive plan, to focus development into the urban areas to create quality living areas, avoid sprawl, improve access to service and protect rural areas. The property seeking the special use permit is designated rural by the, the current comp plan. And additionally, as Mariah stated, is in the hardware ag forest district. According to the comp plan, through this designation, property owners agree not to convert their farm, forest land, and other open space lands to more intense commercial, industrial, or residential uses. In reading your plan, it is clearly a more intensive use for this property. Also to note, the comp plan clearly says 
When setting priorities among conservation projects, the county should place particular value on sites adjacent to other protected land. These two properties are surrounded by other properties that are conserved, either through a conservation easement or other properties that are in the Ag Forest District. Therefore, the conservation of this property should be priority, prioritized. These are not, my, not only my beliefs, but these are points clearly made by the comprehensive plan. We purchased our property knowing that the comp plan dictated for our, uh, for our area and we're, uh, sorry, um, we purchased our property knowing the terms that the comp plan dictated for our area and we were comfortable with the guidelines set forth in the plan. The thought that these restrictions can be tossed out the window because of an alternate plan is deeply concert, uh, unsettling for, our, for us. You know, I just asked the question, why have a comp plan if you don't follow it? You know, we follow it, our neighbors follow it, and I ask that um, other people follow it uh, as well. Um, and I'm sure I'm probably up to my three minutes, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I have some other questions, which I will submit uh, later. Thank you very much. You actually had time left, um, so, but two minutes, two seconds. Um, so you were just fine, thank you. We have Chris Hawk. Good morning, this is Chris Hawk with the Piedmont Environmental Council, also known as PEC. PEC promotes and protects the natural resources, rural economy, history, and beauty of the Virginia Piedmont. We help our communities envision the Piedmont, protect the land that sustains us, respond to forces of change, and build better communities. PEC views environmental education and access as integral to our mission, and this application appears to share similar goals for trauma-induced children and families. The following comments are intended to address our concerns regarding land use planning, as special use permits typically run with the land and not with the user. While the mission appears to provide environmental education and access, the current proposal could be strengthened by incorporating the following five recommendations that aim to address location, size, and scope limitations. The first, adhering to the hardware AFD. The subject property is included within the AFD, which was last renewed in 2019 and is up for its next renewal in 2024. PEC believes that the current proposal is not within keeping of the AFD requirements, nor those necessary for AFD withdrawal. Number two, limiting on-site uses to day camp activities. We believe the special use permit should be limited to only summer camp day camp activities, emphasizing that the subject property is only 54 acres and has limited ability for the buffering and screening needed to protect the adjoining area, neighboring properties, and the hardware AFD from the impacts of year-round board, boarding camp and event venue activities. The small size of the subject property is further, further limited by the on-site prime and locally important agricultural soils, steep slopes, intact forested land, a historic home, and a pond. The proposed boarding camp and special events could have similar impacts to those of transient lodging, wedding venues, and event centers. Number three, limiting new building footprints. The proposal includes over 13,000 square feet of new buildings. Given the on-site soils inclusion within the AFD and county staff's recommendations, PEC recommends that a little to no additional square footage be included on site. New construction could impact the property's future for agricultural and forestal use. No amplified noise. There should be no amplified noise permitted on site other than what is necessary for emergency announcements. And the last, trip generation and shared transportation. In accordance with the VDOT's request for trip generation data, PEC further recommends that the application include a shared use transportation plan, such as buses and carpooling, that are protected, protective of the public health, safety, and welfare of those traveling along Route 29 and existing uh, adjoining landowners. Depending on trip generation, a commercial entrance and turn lanes could be required by VDOT. Limiting on-site travel to a majority shared transportation could also reduce the impacts from parking areas that, quote, would not be expected in a rural area and would negatively impact the character of the area, end quote. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our comments this evening. We would be um, open to further discussing with the applicant and county staff please feel free to reach out with me, to me with any questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Chris. We have Joanne Boyle. Hi, uh, my name is Joanne Boyle and I, as well as Sina and Lindsay have been a part of um, uh, Reclaimed Hope initiative for a couple of years now through the wonderful works of Bettina and Paul. And um, I mean, I think the thing that I wanna just add is a new parent of an adopted um, child uh, a couple of years ago was that I had no um, way to kind of figure it all out. And until I met Bettina and Paul, um, their, grac their graciousness in terms of just guiding um, parents through the whole ordeal of therapy, occupational, physical, developmental peds, whatever it might be, just understanding what comes along with adoption and foster care. Uh, there's a lot that you don't understand prior to. And so it's after the fact that you're scrambling to um, best serve your child. And I think um, there is just not um, an organization that is uh, like Paul and Bettina's with Reclaimed Hope in terms of the amount of information and guidance and care that they have given to so many families. Um, I, I think the biggest thing I wanna get across is that Bettina and Paul are the most genuine, kind, caring, giving, serving couple I've ever come across. And I, the amount of work that they've taken on to um, help others, um, it cannot be mentioned in this one hour. Um, and I say all that to say that they have I am sure they have given as much time and thought into not disrupting um, and not um, in any way putting um, people around the um, uh, development in any type of um, strained uh, decision making. I mean, they 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 are putting so much thought into everything because. Um, just when we meet as a group, the amount of care um, caregivers that they bring in and how qualified they are and how well they take care of our children, um, they want no disruption whatsoever when this um, uh, land gets developed and uh, for the purposes that they've mentioned. And um, the, I, I am sure they are up late at night thinking of how we keep everything where we can serve families, but at the same time, not disrupt any. Um, anyone living around the area. Um, and I'm sure that's, that's not fifth on their list. If, if anything, it's first and second. And so I just want to say that because of the type of people that they are, uh, they will serve the community well. Um, I, I, I am sure of that. Thank you. Thank you. We have Bernard Van Rosen. Hey, good evening, everybody. This is Baron Van Royen. Uh, I live in an adjacent parcel. And uh, again, want to echo, I guess, Nora and other people's comments that, you know, very supportive of the organization and the mission and nothing that I think I or other neighbors have to say or raise as questions or concerns is meant as a negative statement on the camp or what you guys are doing. Obviously, tremendous work. It's more about this lot, this development plan, the Ag District, et cetera, uh, rather than the initiative itself. I had sort of a two-part question or statement, and one was about maybe for the county, uh, how much consideration was being given to the ability to convert the property back to ag forestal if the camp eventually either outgrew the property or for you know unfortunate circumstances, it didn't work out. I see basketball court, parking for a large number of cars, pool, uh, an emergency vehicle path to accommodate vehicles up to 80,000 pounds. It seems like a lot of hard non-porous surfaces, permanent structures, things like that, that are difficult to convert back. And I asked the county to consider that. And the second one was maybe more for the applicants, again, just sort of clarifying question. Maybe that isn't consistent with the format of the meeting. But when I read through the proposal at peak, and I understand how you have to apply for one thing, even if you don't intend to use all of it, but my reading of it is that for 12 weeks out of the year, there could be up to 65 or 70 campers and counselors uh, with multiple trips per day. So 150-ish cars per day, maximal potential uh, during the day camp. During the non-camp events, up to eight times a year, 75 people. And then community events, 50 people, four weeks out of the year. 
meaning 32 weeks out of the year, there'd be 50 plus people on a 50 acre parcel that presently houses like six people. It strikes me as a highly intensive use. And you spoke earlier, uh, Bettina in particular, about the quietness, the respite. I think again, just echoing neighbors' comments, like this is a very rural and quiet area. And there's one use being discussed about this you know, retreat and then there's a bunch of paragraphs and sort of comments and riders for these optional additional uses, which if approved are available and concerning for neighbors. So that's all I've got. Mariah, do you want us to respond to that, answer that, the question? If they lost Mariah. Yeah, I think I think we're losing her. Let me just answer. I mean, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, Bear, I think we spoke about this earlier as well, but um, I'll just quickly answer that. Um, but the idea again is mentioned is we have to put everything in the special use permit that we could ever want to do for the eternity of the property. Um, again, to reiterate, the goal is not to have a ton of people on the property. We currently host two conferences a year, um, one in the spring and one in the fall. And that's kind of what we intend to use those larger numbers for. In terms of our camp, many of those campers do carpool or come together. Many of those kids are, many of these families, I should say, have three and four kids. So that's one car for four kids, et cetera. So it, it wouldn't be one kid per car and many of these carpool as well. So the goal would be to limit that footprint as well in terms of how many cars are on the property um, in terms of summer camp. And again, it would be staggered drop off, staggered pickup, um, which we've done in the past so that it's not bulk of cars all at one time coming and leaving the property. And we, we did have a traffic analysis uh, done, so we will provide that in our updated proposal to the county as well. Yes. Okay, we're going to keep going with speakers because Mariah has lost her internet. Um, and um, so we'll just keep going. And if you have any questions, just um, we'll just make a note of it and she'll answer it as soon as possible. So our next speaker is William Izzard. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I, I have to test that because I'm oftentimes demuted when I'm on Zoom. So um, we're the neighbors to the south and we've met the Stevens and they are quite lovely people and they have an absolutely fantastic cause. So. This evening, we're faced with the extremely difficult task of making a NIMBY ar argument against a really, really worthy cause. Now, the reason why we're opposed to it is that we're adjacent on the south side to the proposed site. And more importantly, uh, where our house is, we look right into the top parcel of the proposed site. So the development plan up top uh, that I think mainly includes some additional housing uh, for uh, guests, as well as some housing for caretakers, some further dependencies and outbuildings, we'll look right into. So um, for the record, because this is such a great cause, um, my wife, Annie, and I, we've for years embraced initiatives that are almost exclusively related to children and principally um, children with disabilities and other um, economically disadvantaged children. And we've supported charities like the Boys and Girls Club, Elk Hill, Salvation Army, and local ministries. So we're, we're very much in favor of the cause, but we're very much not in favor of the location. And the reason why we object to it, not only because they're, they would be our neighbors, but this is very clearly a rural zone. It's in a special ag forest zone. These are declining in Albemarle County with the largely uncontrolled development here. Um, Southern Albemarle, uh, North Garden, is a dark part of the county. The surrounding properties are either farmed or they're in easement. And we moved here specifically because of that. Now, I totally get that's a somewhat um, self-serving argument, but we were drawn here because of the low density, the preservation values and the country quality of life. And we really embrace those. We like to get out and hike and bird watch and stargaze and fish and shoot and 
take a stab at farming. Uh, another thing that I think we need to look really, really carefully at, and we'll just recount our struggle down here when we, when we moved here. This is an incredibly dry part of the county. Um, we had to hire a geologist to help us find water. Our first well was all but a dry well, very, very low volume. Our second well, we got a little bit luckier, but we really don't know how long it's, it's going to last. The neighbors to our east also struggled and they hired an out of town geological firm to come in and do some extensive underground mapping in order to figure out where they're going to source their water. At one point for the non potable water, they were even thinking about drawing from the creek. And we had heard um, anecdotal evidence of another person just north of us who had to drill six wells in order to find water. So what we struggle with is with the camp when it's fully scaled with 40 occupants, upwards of 10 staff, possibly six families, and with large events, it's going to put a real uh, crimp on the water supply. And I think they're going to have a hard time finding it, but then selfishly speaking, you know, their gain is going to really put a test on our wells. I think we have a very, very limited aquifer down here. Now, if I could um, maybe touch the third rail here. It's I'm sorry, your three minutes is up. <laughs> okay, I'll go to detention then and I'll put the rest <laughs> of the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Melanie. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Melanie Van Roy, and I also live on an adjacent property. And just a couple of comments and questions about the proposal. So the first one, um, just as background for me, living in the country is relatively new. Um, I have only been here a few years, and I have come to really appreciate country living, despite very much being a city girl. But from that perspective, I think there are some things that I've learned from living here that I'm curious about the compatibility with your proposal. Um, the, the most important to me being around the safety for the children. Um, one of the things that I am not accustomed to, but I have become accustomed to living here is um, the local wildlife and um, hunting in the area. As an ag area, I have come to recognize that hunting, it's not something I necessarily do or have ever, I've never done it actually, um, but it is definitely something that happens in the area uh, quite regularly. And um, I remember the first time being on my property and seeing a bear and quickly just running inside, although it turns out they are quite harmless and I am probably, there's probably um, no real threat there for, for myself. But I, I am curious about whether that had been um, just explore, just because as somebody from the city, it's not something I ever would have thought about. Um, and, and I am concerned uh, with so many uh, people nearby who may or may not have that context, because I know for me, I didn't have that context when I moved here. Um, one of the other things that I'm curious about is I saw in the county comments that um, there was something about the applicants making note that they, they may live on site and a recommendation then to um, perhaps ex uh, make an exception for personal use uh, for, for events. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about that since I didn't hear it um, in the opening around that, what that might be about. And um, the last thing I was curious about is any plans for um, fencing or demarcating the, uh, the, the property lines uh, just again, thinking about uh, what the surrounding parcels and um, making sure it's clear between the property lines and what that may look like and, and also how close any hiking trails or, or any of the additional um, kind of usage plans and, and where, where, how close that comes to the property lines and how it will be made clear um, where the property is versus adjacent lots. Um, Paul and Bettina, do you want to take the fence question first and then I'll follow up? Yeah, we plan to assess that uh, thoroughly, but we have talked about fencing at least along the Camp Carroll lines where the kids would stay to demarcate property lines and also give a firm boundary. Um, in terms of safety, we staff 
um, one to two caregivers. So one caregiver for two children. So we make sure that safety is a high priority for these kids, um, especially since many of them are non-mobile or um, have difficulty with mobility. So we would make sure that safety is high, but we're definitely gonna cover that base as well, um, a little bit in more detail in our um, next um, proposal. Um, and then in terms of fencing from the county perspective, um, the county would not be looking at, at fencing or marking property lines. Um, that's not typically something that we, that we look at with special use permits. Um, and there's no, um, with any conditions, we have to draw a nexus to what impact is it mitigating. Um, this would be hard to draw a nexus with. It's more of a, um, a private property matter. Um, so the county probably would not be looking at that. Um, and then in terms of the, uh, if, if the Stevens decided to use one of the houses as a residential house um, for their own families, what we want to avoid is a condition that's placed on the camp being um, restrictive to their family um, and residential use of the property if it's a phased uh, special use permit. So for example, if they really only developed the lower portion for the kids and they didn't have that adult portion um, associated with it and they lived in that top portion, what we wouldn't want to have is um, restricting them from having a, a family Christmas gathering or, or holiday gathering of any sort denomination. Um, just because they can't have more than six households visiting at one time. So um, the county is just trying to parse through how can we um, have conditions that specifically address that special use permit and don't have overarching effects for residential use. Um, so I think Melanie, did we answer all of the questions? Um, we have six minutes. Sorry, six seconds. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I can I can email any more questions and comments as follow up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. We have Becky Go Goodman. Hi, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I am somewhat new to Crozet. Uh, my husband and I have one birth daughter and two adopted children who've experienced uh, more trauma than uh, I myself can imagine. And we moved here to Crozet uh, for what everyone is describing with, with so much joy and, and love. And we moved here for the calm scenery. And we, we lucked out in meeting Paul and Bettina and discovering what support truly feels like. And it is not available anywhere we have lived. We've lived in many places. And this is a rare treasure that they are trying to build. And, um, my thinking is, is that if you want to build hope for these children, for these families, that sometimes that means to build a physical building. Uh, we as families do not have safe spaces to go. I very much respect that the need for everyone to have this beautiful scenery that you moved here or you are here because of the calm setting. And my ask is for you to open your hearts even more than you already have because you've all been so respectful of this cause is that these are children who have seen things and experienced things that maybe we can't imagine and they deserve the opportunity to be in a beautiful place while they're re-experiencing constant trauma in their minds and bodies. And we have a son now who's in an institution that does feel prison-like. 
And maybe if this had been here for him years ago, he would not be where he is today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Becky. Um, as we approach eight o'clock, um, I don't think we'll be able to get to everyone tonight that has raised their hand. So I just wanna apologize for that and let you know that you can email me. Um, we have time for one more speaker. Um, so Vivian, if you wouldn't mind. We um, have Diane Gibbs. Hello. Um, my name is Diane and I am a parent with Reclaimed Hope. And I want to back with Joanne and Becky and Lindsay and what everybody has said. And speaking as um, about a, two years ago, we, or about a year and a half ago, we had two children and that came to our house from the city. Um, and we tried to give them the love and support. And we unfortunately had to disrupt um, placement to add more trauma onto children. Um, and if we would have had a place that we could have taken the kids to that had some land or had a place where they could garden or go on nature walks, um, I wonder if those children would have not had to be disrupted with our family. Um, and we currently have two children who the summer was extremely hard for. Um, we were kicked out of a camp. We made it a day and a half um, where they just couldn't be there because it was too overwhelming, too many people too overstimulating and to be able to go to a camp or a place that is safe and secure and quiet to give him the loving and support that he needed is huge. Um, and just to think about a place that's there for families to go and be supported and loved in a safe place and being respectful of the area and the environment and the soil and the nature that I know Paul and Bettina are definitely making sure they put fourth first would be huge for this area. Thank you, Diane. Um, with that, we're gonna be respectful of everybody's time. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. And again, if we did not get to you tonight, um, please feel free to email me and I will pull up my email now. Okay, um, so again, if you didn't get an opportunity to speak, um, I apologize, but want to be respectful of everybody's time tonight. You know, it's late. Um, so if you want to email me, my email is mgleason at albemoral.org. Um, and if you email me, I will be putting together a, um, a an email distribution list. I will add you to that. I'll use that email list to share information regarding when the revised proposal materials are submitted, um, where they can be found and public hearing meeting dates and information when they're known. Um, and, and just so you know, you can write in at any time. That's not limited to just the next week. Um, so feel free to email. And um, beyond that, um, Paul and Bettina, do you have anything any kind of... uh, no, just thank you everyone for your time. We appreciate the interest and the comments. Um, we will certainly do our best to respond, work with Mariah and whatever the right protocol there is. Um, we are very relational people, if you can't tell on our pro side. So I, I just don't want to come off like we, we don't care. We're not listening. Um, we do care. Um, and we, we want this to happen. So we want to make sure we hear all sides and we want to be good neighbors, uh, whether we're in our current house or wherever we may have, end up in the future. So just to thank you to everyone for their thoughts, comments, and concerns. Yeah, and I just wanted to, the last thing I wanted to add was just, um, we hear everybody's comments, especially neighbors around um, not wanting it to be here. And I, I think we would just love to extend um, 
the thought that it's really not conducive for families in crisis to drive an hour to camp every day for their kid to go to a summer camp and then drive to work. So the goal is just like there's other camps here in town um, where our goal is to not only accommodate the families we serve, but also do that in a way that's extremely respectful to not only a comprehensive plan in the county, but also to our neighbors. So that's not something that we're taking lightly or that we're trying to disregard. And we just want to continue to be as transparent as possible. And we are open to any further questions you may have in the future. And I just really quickly like to offer that as a board member, um, like Paul and Bettina are incredible and amazing. Uh, and I know that they have done an incredible job answering your questions. But if any of the neighbors or community members would like to have a conversation with um, the board or other board members, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're here as well. Um, so I just offer that. Um. Okay, well, well, thank you, everyone. Um, I guess I will add if you if you email me and you would like me to share it through to the applicant or be connected, um, please let me know in your email and I will um, forward it as appropriate. And overall, thank you again, everyone for joining us tonight. We appreciate that you took the time to be here. And um, with that, we're going to close the meeting. So have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.